Tonight, top story live from Englewood, California. The countdown is on for Super Bowl 56. More than 70,000 fans expected here at SoFi Stadium when the hometown Rams take on the Cincinnati Bengals. Our interview tonight with Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. What health precautions are in place as the city welcomes that many fans during a pandemic? Plus the massive security operation underway. Law enforcement with eyes on the ground, air and sea. Fans not just excited for the game, but the star-studded halftime show sure to make LA proud and I go inside an F-16 fighter jet for a bird's eye view of the flyover event that takes place right before kickoff. Also tonight, Lester Holt's exclusive interview with President Biden pressing him on the pandemic and the economy as inflation hits a 40-year high and Lester joins Top Story Live with a preview including what the president told him about picking a Supreme Court justice. The U.S. with a stark warning for Russia tonight as it holds a large-scale military drill with Belarus. Thousands of Russian troops practicing combat operations near Ukraine's northern border. Putin now with nine different routes to invade Ukraine. But tonight, a senior U.S. official telling NBC's Andrea Mitchell body bags will return to Russia if he does. Plus, the latest on the shocking death of comedian Bob Saget. The autopsy report revealed he died from blunt head trauma and was positive for COVID-19 at the time. Sarah Palin testifies, the former governor of Alaska, taking the stand during her libel trial against the New York Times. At one point, comparing the newspaper to the biblical character, Goliath. And super fans, the three men who have attended every Super Bowl ever played. They're here tonight with what they're hoping to see in year 56. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Top Story is live tonight outside of SoFi Stadium in Englewood, California. You can see just behind me, the stadium is ready. Los Angeles and Englewood also ready for the crush of fans. And both teams, we hope, are also ready for what many are predicting could be the biggest Super Bowl ever. The less than two-year-old stadium ready for its up close. A record number of Americans expected to tune into the Super Bowl on Sunday, and it will be a packed house inside with tens of thousands of fans set to attend the big game in person. And of course, a major security operation is underway. More than 10 federal agencies will join more than a dozen local law enforcement teams to keep eyes on every corner of the stadium and outside. Also a concern, the pandemic. But Los Angeles' Mayor Eric Garcetti told me he is confident the city is prepared to welcome a crowd of this size and safely. There's also a lot of excitement about the halftime show. Mary J. Blige, Dr. Dre, and Snoop Dogg today promising an epic performance. And I was able to get a preview of the flyover before kickoff from inside of an F-16. Whether you're watching in person or at home, it's expected to be an event you do not want to miss. Tonight, the countdown is on. More than 70,000 fans set to pack SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California to watch the hometown Rams take on the Cincinnati Bengals. A record-breaking 117 million people expected to tune in to Super Bowl 56 for a matchup no one could have predicted. The players preparing to take center stage. Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow looking to become the first quarterback to win a Heisman, a national championship, and a Super Bowl on the heels of a stunning come-from-behind victory in the AFC championship game. You know, maybe a, a comeback is going to be necessary, but you know we'd like to jump out early and kind of control the game. Veteran quarterback Matt Stafford traded to the Rams at the end of last season, coming from Detroit with the weight of the world on his shoulders. This team has sacrificed a lot and gone through a lot to get to the point that we are. Um, we're excited to be able to do it in our home stadium. The Rams' dominating defense led by one of the league's most imposing forces and best players looking for his first Super Bowl ring. Guys is hungry for it, so um, I'm just more focused on what we got to do to dominate the four quarters, fly around and make a ton of plays. Los Angeles and its mayor, Eric Garcetti, playing host to tens of thousands of fans eager to catch the epic matchups even in the middle of a pandemic with mass guidelines changing by the hour. The mayor himself taking heat after a photo surfaced of him at the playoffs not wearing a mask. He says he took it off for the photo. What advice would you give to football fans flying in from all over the country? I mean, wearing a mask during a football game is tough. You, you know this firsthand. So what advice would you have for them? Well, my first advice, if you're a mayor, don't pull your mask down during a picture. I've learned that experience. But we have those rules in place. We've got a lot of people who are still dying. We're headed in the right direction. So let's try to respect that. But it really relies on us doing the right thing. The city no stranger to blockbuster events. 
So when you look at Los Angeles and the greater Los Angeles area, are you ready for the Super Bowl? We are so ready. This, this isn't just muscle memory for us. This is our daily workout, whether it's the Grammys or the Oscars, whether it's going to be the Olympics again for a third time or the Super Bowl. We know how to host these events. We love welcoming people here. And it's just icing on the cake that the Rams are in the Super Bowl. The Rams, not the only hometown favorites in the spotlight. A star-studded halftime performance featuring some of California's heaviest hitters could steal the show. Hip-hop legends Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Mary J. Blige, and Kendrick Lamar promising to do L.A. proud, along with Detroit native Eminem. Not trying to be um, egotistical or anything like that, but who else could do this show here in L.A.? We appreciate the NFL for even entertaining hip-hop because we know a lot of people didn't want hip-hop on stage. True but that. we're here now and it ain't nothing you can do Thank about you. <laughs> And today we got a preview of the oh, high-flying that? start planned for Sunday's game. You know I got your back, right? <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. You can be my wingman anytime. <laughs> Major Garrett Schmitz, call sign Toro, taking us up in an F-16 fighter jet. He's part of the elite team that will execute a tightly choreographed flyover just moments before kickoff. Some people might think like, ah, oh, that's gotta be the easiest thing to do, but it's kinda hard, because you gotta time it perfectly so you fly over once the national anthem ends. It is incredibly hard. So it's to the second, pretty much. We've got the national anthem timed out for each word pretty much where it should be. So if she's taking longer, if she's faster, we know and we can adjust the throttle. So that's a lot of like real time coordination that people don't get to see. Those pilots are incredible. It was the ride of a lifetime. They even let me fly at one point. You can see much more of that F-16 flyover tomorrow on the Today Show. But now we want to continue our Super Bowl coverage. While Los Angeles is used to being on the world stage, the city is not taking any chances. The game has been classified as a tier one special event, meaning top law enforcement officials from across the country will be on guard planning to protect the game has been underway for more than a year on land and even at sea. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has a closer look. In a city where all eyes will be on the Super Bowl, not everyone will be watching the game. NORAD, this is the Conar CCO. One of the nation's most elaborate security nets tonight entangling Los Angeles on the ground, in the air, and at sea. Threats can be coming from any angle. A Super Bowl with a supersized security detail. Field teams who have no known credible threats will help quarterback the massive security blitz. Fighter jets are standing by at the ready. More than 10 federal agencies game planning with some 13 local law enforcement teams. Thousands of officers will be on the ground and hovering just above it. You know, what's keeping me up at night right now is just the, the population density, the air density, the complexity of this Super Bowl. SoFi sits in the shadow of LAX. Planes and drones, an added threat. Flying low and slow, the CBP will be in the air all of game day. The eye of the sky is a critical asset, but it's hardly the only one. Southern California's Golden Coast also on red alert. Marine crews like this one will primarily be focused on about 50 miles of coastline leading up to and on Super Bowl Sunday, a threat that could come from anywhere. Strike teams have been planning for over a year. You know, for us, every day is game day. So, you know, the players eat, sleep, live football. You know, we eat, sleep, live maritime law enforcement. Tonight for law enforcement on this playing field, there is no room for a fumble. Miguel joins us now live from Los Angeles. And Miguel, I want to ask you about a possible threat here in L.A. You know, we have seen these massive truck protests over COVID mandates in Canada, which is now escalating and could spill over into the U.S. And now I understand there's a concern about this impacting the Super Bowl this weekend. Yeah, that's right. absolutely right, Tom. Law enforcement has been given a bulletin that there could be a protest outside of the stadium where you are okay. right now in the, in the hours preceding the Super Bowl. Of course, it's very easy for authorities to kind of control that security blanket on stadium property where you are, but just outside of the stadium, that task becomes much more difficult. We'll see if that protest actually develops and how quickly and forcefully law enforcement can respond. Tom.
Miguel Almaguer tonight with the state of security at the Super Bowl. And one thing fans, athletes, and performers will all face this week an unseasonably high heat. A rare winter heat advisory issued for Los Angeles, and it could be the hottest Super Bowl on record. We're already feeling some of the effects of that heat wave, so we want to bring in Al Roker with a look at just how hot it will be. Al, I got to tell you, I'm getting flashbacks from the Olympics in Tokyo. It's not that hot, but it's, it's approaching there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it, this is unusual for this time of year. In fact, take a look. 18 million people uh, are being affected by these heat advisories through Sunday from San Fernando and Malibu all the way down to San Diego. And in fact, it's the first time since 2005 there's been a heat advisory posted anywhere in the United States. Now, L.A.'s hottest February on record was 95 back in February 20th of 1995. Today, looking for a high of 89 downtown. Uh, yesterday was 83, tomorrow 86. By Super Bowl Sunday, 87. That's five straight days of highs in the 80s. Big high pressure pumping in Santa Ana winds. So you can see these temperatures anywhere from 10 to almost 20 degrees above average, Tom. And in fact, tomorrow, we look for records in Vegas, Needles, L.A., Palm Springs, up to Sacramento. Sacramento and Fresno. And it's going to last right on into the weekend. Of course, the question being, what happens with the Super Bowl? Well, of course, the top five warmest Super Bowls, number one, January 14th, 73, Super Bowl seven, right there in L.A., with a high of 84 degrees. And on Sunday, just about kickoff, we're looking for a temperature, Tom, of about 83 degrees, that's 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, as the Rams host the Bengals, but we could see the hottest ever, so we're going to keep an eye on that. But again, folks are ready for some hot football. Well, in more ways than one, they're going to get it, Tom. The game won't be the only thing hot. All right, Al, we appreciate you. Now to an NBC News exclusive tonight, President Biden on the major crisis facing his administration one year into the job. From the pandemic to skyrocketing inflation, he sat down with NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt for an in-depth conversation. Mr. President, in recent days, we've seen numerous governors from blue states roll back indoor mask requirements, essentially getting ahead of the federal government, the CDC. Are those governors wrong? Well, it's hard to say whether they're wrong. Here's the science is saying now that masks work, masks make a difference, and there's a relationship. I think there's only one governor drawing back immediately. And most of them are somewhere in February, I mean, the end of February, March, April, they're set a time limit. And I assume it has something to do with whether the Omicron variant continues to dive, there are fewer and fewer cases. And because there is a relationship between the number of cases you have in your community and the need for wear masks. Do you acknowledge, though, a restlessness and, and leaders bowing to the political winds? Oh, I do. Omicron and the variant, all the variants, have had a profound impact on the psyche of the American people. Should children be required to wear masks in schools? Well, look, when I got in office, only 46% of the schools were open. Now 98% of them are open, and they're wearing masks. What's happening is, every day that goes by, children are more protected. We're now on the verge of being able to have shots for children under the age of seven and uh, young children. And, uh, and so the more protection they have, probably you're going to see less and less requirement to have the masks. But the CDC hasn't changed its guidance on that. And it, it, the question is, with these governors making these moves, does it begin to make the government, the CDC, irrelevant, that, that people will gravitate toward, you know, the advice that really fits their worldview, that this thing feels like it's over? Well, um, Look, I think it's one thing to say, to talk about masks, other than to talk about shots and boosters and the like. Uh, and, uh, but it's, you know, look, it is confusing. It's worrisome to people. They're trying to figure out. But what I've tried to do, I've tried to make sure we have all the vaccines needed, all the boosters needed, all the masks are needed, all the protection is needed. Are you afraid, though, that some states and, and cities are moving too quickly to loosen indoor mask mandates? Well, you know, it's uh, I com I committed that I would follow the science, the science as put forward by the CDC and the, and the and the federal people, and uh, 
I think it's probably premature, but it's, you know, it's, it's a tough call. Then there was today's sour headline on the economy. Inflation skyrocketing to 7.5 percent, a 40-year high. Prices still spiking on everything from used cars to gas to food. Inflation now costing the average American an extra $275 a month compared to last year. I think it was back in July you said inflation was going to be temporary. I think a lot of Americans are wondering what your definition of temporary is. Well, you're being a wise guy with me a little bit, uh, and I understand that's your job. But look, uh, at the time, what happened was the, uh, let's look at the reason for the inflation. The reason for the inflation is the supply chains were cut off, meaning that the products, for example, automobiles, the lack of computer chips to be able to build those automobiles so they could function, they need those computer chips. They were not available. So what happens? We, the number of cars were reduced, the new cars reduced, it made up at one point, one third the cost of inflation because the price of automobiles were up. So what I did when I went out and made sure we started to make those domestically, we got Intel to come in and provide $20 billion to build a new facility. A number of organizations are doing the same kinds of things. When can Americans expect some relief from this soaring inflation? According to Nobel laureates, 14 of them that contacted me and a number of corporate leaders, it's ought to be able to start to taper off as we go through this year. In the meantime, I'm going to do everything in my power to deal with the big points that are, that are Im impacting most people in their homes. NBC News Nightly News anchor Lester Holt joins us now live. Lester, this was such a wide-ranging interview. I know you touched upon Ukraine and the Supreme Court. I want to ask you first about the Supreme Court. Did the president indicate anywhere where he stands now in the process of picking a Supreme Court nominee? Yeah, he did. In fact, you'll recall he said he would make a pick up likely by the end of this month. But he did say that he's down to about four people that are, are undergoing some vetting right now, some really fine, uh, fine uh, vetting, uh, trying to make sure that, you know, they pass muster. So that suggests this process is moving along. I did ask him uh, if he's looking for someone who he believes will get some Republican support. He believes all his picks, anyone he picks, will get Republican support because he claims he will not be making an ideological uh, pick. Could also be a historical pick. We're going to have to wait and see. And Lester, the president also touched on the growing tension on the border of Ukraine. Yeah, we talked about that. He seems to continue to hold to the idea that Vladimir Putin can be deterred by these massive sanctions that he keeps talking about. I asked the president uh, about American citizens who might be in Ukraine, if they would be in a position that they would need to get troops to get Americans out to evacuate. He rejected that uh, clearly, uh, said any time you put armed troops against one of the largest armies in the world, that things can go bad very quickly. So he rejected that idea. And he called for Americans. He says not just diplomats, any American in Ukraine should get out. Okay, a stark warning right there. Lester Holt for us tonight with that big exclusive interview with the president. You can watch more of Lester's interview with President Biden in coverage ahead of the Super Bowl this Sunday on NBC. Now, the president there weighing in on the situation in Ukraine as Russia's massive military drills in Belarus and the Black Sea are stoking fears that Moscow could invade. Thousands of troops were seen training for combat. The U.S. now calling this an escalation and warning that if Putin invades, body bags will come back to Moscow. Here's Matt Bradley with more. Tonight, the war game is growing more dangerous on the Ukrainian border. Russia staging its largest military deployment in Belarus since the Cold War, fueling fears of an invasion. Now, this dire warning coming from the U.S. State Department of what they call an escalation. Vladimir Putin should understand that body bags will come back to Moscow as well, that the citizens of Russia will suffer because their economy will be completely devastated. Uh, so this is a very stark choice for him. And in spite of all that is going on right now, as you described, we hope he makes the right choice. This footage released by Russia's defense ministry showing thousands of troops practicing combat operations. The drills in Belarus are scheduled to last another 10 days. But NBC News has learned a U.S. military assessment shows Russian troops could take nine different routes into Ukraine. 
and have tanks in the capital within 48 hours. The intelligence shows it could be an attack by air, land and sea, with Russian warships arriving in the Black Sea for naval drills off Ukraine's southern coast. This is diplomatic talks took a drastic turn in the wrong direction. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov having a tense exchange with his British counterpart Liz Truss accusing her of refusing to listen to his argument, saying it was like a blind person talking to a deaf person. At a press conference, Lavrov walking away briskly, leaving Truss alone at the podium. This is probably the most dangerous moment, uh, I would say, in the, in the course of the next few days, in what is the uh, biggest security crisis that uh, Europe has faced for, for decades. With Ukraine teetering on the edge of invasion, Americans who have ignored the government warnings to leave spoke with my colleague Aaron McLaughlin about joining any potential fight. If Russian soldiers come on Ukrainian soil, they're going to have to die. And somebody's going to have to help the Ukrainian army make that happen. Yeah, Tom, those Russian naval exercises in the Black Sea, they're really ominous as well. They're set to start on Sunday, and they're supposed to last for nearly a week. And Ukrainian authorities have said they're basically tantamount to a blockade. And, you know, what's really provocative about this is that the Black Sea has seen some flashpoints between Russia and Ukraine in just the recent past. And with relations between those countries so poor right now, it seems like anything could start a war. Tom? Matt Bradley reporting in tonight from Ukraine. Back here at home, there was high drama in a New York courtroom today with former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin taking the stand in her defamation case against the New York Times, testifying she sees herself as David against Goliath in the legal battle over whether the newspaper damaged her reputation with a mistake in its editorial pages. NBC's Dasha Burns has more. Tonight, Sarah Palin taking the stand. What do you want the jury to know, Sarah? The former Alaska governor testifying in her defamation lawsuit against the New York Times. For truth, Bill. Today, getting to the heart of her claim that the Times damaged her reputation by linking her campaign rhetoric to a mass shooting in a 2017 editorial. Saying on the stand she felt, quote, powerless against the paper. Saying, quote, it was devastating to read, again, an accusation, a false accusation, that I had anything to do with murder, murdering innocent people. And accusing the Times of, quote, trying to score political points, calling the paper the be-all, end-all, the loud voice in American media, comparing it to the biblical character Goliath and herself to David. What does Sarah Palin's legal team have to prove here? She has to prove the New York Times published a false statement about her that caused her harm. Did the Times have reason to know at the time it published this statement that it was false and were they willfully blind to that fact? Joining us now from Phoenix is Governor Palin. Palin sued the Times in 2017, accusing the paper of damaging her reputation as a political commentator. With an opinion piece about gun control after Republican Representative Steve Scalise was injured in a shooting. The editorial erroneously implying a link between Palin's political action committee and the 2011 shooting that injured Representative Gabby Giffords and killed six others. It said the PAC circulated a map of candidates in stylized crosshairs. But the Times issued a correct two days later, saying it, quote, incorrectly stated that a link existed and that it had incorrectly described the map. It's all but undisputed that this was a mistake. The key will be the intent behind that mistake. Earlier this week, former editorial editor James Bennett testifying the wording was a, quote, terrible mistake, saying, quote, we are human beings. We do make mistakes. This case is really about what happens when a mistake is made and if it's corrected immediately, is there still a harm? Is there still defamation? And can a plaintiff still win, even when a defendant realizes quickly they made a mistake and does everything they can to fix it? Closing arguments are set for Friday. All right, Dasha joins us now live from New York. Now, Dasha, I'm curious, who do legal experts say has the upper hand here? Because it's so rare that these cases actually make it to trial. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. And, you know, a lot of lawyers will tell you people think that they have defamation cases all the time. It may be one of the more common suits people want to file, but it's among the more rare types of cases that actually get to the courtroom. And that's because the bar for plaintiffs, especially public figures like Sarah Palin, is so high. The law favors the press. However, Tom, uh, it, those in the media will definitely be watching closely because this case could have significant ramifications for journalists if Palin does win. Tom?
No doubt people are tracking this all over the country. All right, Dasha, we thank you. The fall from grace. Jerry Harris, you may remember him. He was the breakout star of the hit Netflix series Cheer, now pleading guilty to sex crimes involving minors. How many years behind, how many years behind bars he's facing? Kids in the crossfire, two children fatally shot just days apart in Houston. The action from city leaders to try and stop that rampant violence. And the car crash landing on a roof. What witnesses say led up to this wild scene. Stay with us. Top story on this Thursday night. Just getting started from Los Angeles. Back now with a series of disturbing shootings in Houston. A nine-year-old girl shot in the head in her family's car. It comes only days after another child was gunned down in the city. The spike in crime part of a nationwide trend as Houston grapples with how to stop the violence. Priscilla Thompson has more. And a warning tonight, parts of this story are difficult to watch. Tonight, heartbreak in Houston as children fall victim to mounting gun violence. <laughs> Surveillance video captured the screams of nine-year-old Ashanti Grant's family after discovering she had been shot in the head while riding to the grocery store. Ashanti now in critical condition, fighting for her life. My family is numb right now. A pickup truck cut the family's vehicle off several times, police say. GMC shot out the window and into the air. Then the driver of that truck opened fire. Somebody saw it shooting in the vehicle and they called her name and... She didn't respond. Her family now grappling with the pain similar to that of 11-year-old Darius DJ Dugas, who was shot and killed less than a week before. His mom, devastated. <gasps> The boy went downstairs just after 6 p.m., according to his mom, to get his jacket and other items out of the car. He was not downstairs one minute before we heard gunshots, and me and my oldest son ran down the stairs. When my oldest found him, Land down, lifeless. Witnesses told police they saw what appeared to be a teen boy running away after the shooting. You're not just hurting people's parents like you're hurting communities. You're not going to get away with this. Much like the nation, the homicide rate in Houston has spiked since the pandemic began. The Houston Police Department reporting a nearly 70 percent increase from 2019 to 2021. The number of children and teenagers killed by gunfire in the U.S. has also risen dramatically. The rate of gun deaths of children under 14 up about 50 percent from the end of 2019 to the end of 2020, according to CDC data. These are all tragedies. Houston area judge Lena Hidalgo this week announcing a gun violence intervention program and a holistic assistance response team initiative to help stop the violence. They're not going to change overnight, but we are investing every dollar that the budget will sustain. $1.4 billion in all for those programs and others as police continue the hunt for the suspected shooters of Ashanti and DJ. My baby was only 11 years old and he had a really bright future ahead of him. And y'all took that away from him. Such a sad story. Priscilla Thompson joins us now from 30 Rock in New York. Priscilla, you know, we've heard about these violence interrupters before. What more can you tell us about those new programs aimed at combating this violence? Yeah, Tom, the county is spending $6 million to send what they're calling trusted messengers into communities at high risk of gun violence to stop conflicts before they escalate. They're also investing $5 million in health professionals who can respond to non-emergency social welfare calls so that the police can focus on violent crimes. As for the rest of that $1.4 billion budget, it will be used for a number of other things, including more investigators, prosecutors, and patrol officers. Tom? All right, we hope all that money can make some type of difference. When we come back, the shocking death of Bob Saget, the autopsy just released, appearing to show the comedian died after accidentally hitting his head. Back now live from the site of Super Bowl 56 with Top Stories newsfeed, and we begin with the Netflix star pleading guilty to child pornography and sex abuse charges. Cheer star Jerry Harris changing his plea to two of seven federal charges as part of a deal. He's accused of soliciting sex from minors as young as 13 at cheerleading competitions. The 22-year-old was arrested in December 2020. He faces up to 50 years behind bars when he's sentenced in June. All right, a wild ending to a crash in Oklahoma City. Take a look at this. New video shows a BMW perched up against the roof of a home. 
Eyewitnesses say the car hit something and then went airborne before rolling over and landing on top of that house. Rescuers were able to free the driver. He was taken to the hospital, but he is expected to be okay. And a big week for Snoop Dogg, who is now the owner of Death Row Records. The rapper and mogul acquiring the label that launched his career from a private equity firm. Death Row was founded in 1992, you may remember, by Dr. Dre and Suge Knight and others. It's had several other owners since going bankrupt in 2006. The sale comes just days before Snoop and Dre are set to perform at the Super Bowl halftime show. No word yet on the price tag there. All right. Turning now to the tragic death of actor Bob Saget. Tonight, the medical examiner releasing his autopsy, suggesting the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head from an accidental fall. NBC's Emily Aketa has those details. Hi, Daddy. Michelle. <laughs> Don't scare Daddy like that. We now know how the famed Full House father, Bob Saget, suddenly died last month. Blunt force trauma. A just released autopsy report calling his death an accident, saying the comedy icon most likely fell backwards, fracturing his skull and causing a brain bleed. Authorities also noting he was COVID 19 positive and there were no illicit drugs found in his system. Security officer found a guest not breathing, no pulse. Saget was found dead January 9th during a wellness check at his Florida hotel room. He had been in town for his comedy tour, tweeting earlier that day, I had no idea I did a two hour set tonight. I'm happily addicted. His I wife opening up on the like Today Show to last with, month. The support has been, that, that has been the one silver lining from this is the incredible outpouring of love and support. Doctors warn head injuries can happen to anyone. If you hurt your ankle, you can see that your ankle hurts. But if you injure your brain, you can't see that. What are the signs that something could be more serious? Any loss of consciousness, any nausea and vomiting, an extreme headache. Now, one month since the beloved actor's passing, his family reminding fans to do as Bob Saget and face Jeez. difficult times with hugs and laughter. Doctors call head trauma the invisible injury, making it all the more dangerous. Like Saget, actress Natasha Richardson died of a hematoma back in 2009 following a skiing accident in Canada. Tom. Emily Aketa with that update. We turn now to Top Stories Global Watch. Three people have been arrested for the murder of a prominent journalist in Mexico. You may remember this story. We brought it to you here on Top Story. Authorities say the suspects took a taxi and waited for three hours outside the home of Lourdes Maldonado before shooting her in the head as she walked to her front door. She is one of four journalists killed in Mexico last month. A trucker protest over vaccine mandates in Canada sparking other demonstrations around the world. Police clashing with protesters outside of New Zealand's parliament on their third day of demonstrations. More than 120 people arrested. The group says they are inspired by the, quote, siege of Ottawa. And hundreds gathered in Nice, France, for a convoy that is expected to travel to Paris and Brussels to demand an end to COVID-19 restrictions. Finally, Queen Elizabeth is being monitored for COVID-19 after her son, Prince Charles, tested positive for a second time. The Prince of Wales is triple vaccinated and is now self-isolating, but he met with his 95-year-old mother just two days ago at Windsor Castle. So far, she's not showing any symptoms. The trio who has attended every single Super Bowl, they joined Top Story Live tonight. What keeps them coming back year after year, the bonds they formed at this game and what they're most looking forward to on Sunday. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a Super Bowl tradition unlike any other. A group of football superfans who have gone to the big game every year since the first one in 1967. The members of the Never Miss a Super Bowl Club have traveled around the country, making a lot of memories and fans of their own all along the way. I want to bring in two of those club members right now, Don Chrisman and Gregory Eaton. Guys, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. I'm, I'm a little worried, though, because we, we first sold you guys as a trio I know Tommy was supposed to be here. He's 80 years old. What, what happened? We're not sure, but uh, he's come up missing before. Okay, but he always turns up. He's okay, right? Uh, yeah, he's, he'll turn up. He could show up <laughs> before we're done here. I don't know how long we're going to go. Don, you got a dapper look, but I want you to tell me about that hat, because that is a Super Bowl artifact right there. Yes, this is the hat I purchased at the Coliseum at Super Bowl One back in 1967. And it's kind of been in mothballs for a couple of years, but I decided to drag it out and bring it here. It's probably worth a lot of money. 
I haven't thought about that aspect of it, but maybe. Maybe. So, so Don, let me ask you, when you went to that first Super Bowl, did you know it was going to be something so special that you would be here 56 years later? Uh, no, it, it was kind of more like a college game, although I do remember one of my comments to the rest of the guys. We started with a different group than we have now, we, and three have passed away. But I said, this might turn into the World Series of football. We ought to go. Gregory, what about you? you you've, I'm sure, made some great memories. You've obviously yeah, made some yeah. good friends. Well, Herb Adderley, who I met at Michigan State, uh, he was on the t team, and he asked, you, we gonna, it wasn't a Super Bowl. It was a World Championship, because the yeah. Super Bowl didn't That's come to three. That's what it was three. called. Yeah. yeah. So I said, yeah, I'm, yeah, California, why not? The sun's shining. So I jumped on board and caught a plane and went. Gregory, what is your favorite single greatest memory of Super Bowls that you've been to? Well, you know, me being 82, I think that uh, uh, when we had our first black quarterback, you know, in my days, you couldn't, blacks couldn't play quarterback. Yeah. You know? and, yeah so that was a big for me. And then uh, Smith and Dungey, yeah. two black coaches. Right. So, you know, I told the reporter, I says, well, I can't lose. Yeah. And, you know, so it was, it was really touching to me being you know, I came to that area that it wasn't done. You saw the game transform. Yeah. Um, you know, Don, for you, your, your single greatest memory, what, what, what you saw up close with your eyes that you'll never forget? Well, it has to be uh, Super Bowl 51 when my Patriots were, I thought we were in the loss column, and Tom brought us back. You got to, wa you got to watch Tom a few times. Yeah, I did. We were fortunate. Uh, Tom has uh, watched him as a buck recently, yeah. and he's you know he's the goat, and uh, he's uh, a lot of memories. So you guys have done 56 Super Bowls. Talk well, to me about the. Uh, well, not oh, not Sunday. yet, not yet. Okay, that's right. But you're going to make it, right? Well, you, it's a good law. It's a good law. <laughs> when the Star Spring Band is playing and we're sitting there, we know we made it. I, I hope you guys make it. I was going to ask you. You've been able to to, to make it this far. Um, what is the? Is there any kind of partying for you guys? Tailgating? Any any kind of crazy party? Uh, we have a luncheon, which will be tomorrow. Uh, we gather at a, you know, a restaurant and get together and relive the the past and, and remember the three guys who are no longer with us. Oh yeah. And, you know, different guys that, have, that I went with are gone. You know, the guys I started with, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, we don't tailgate anymore. We didn't do anything like that, but we it, used it's to. It's got to be more than a game now, right? What? Well, I think it's a reunion and a game, and they're equally important. Yeah. Now, this thing has grown. This is, everyone in the world wants to be on air. Yeah. So it's grown. Uh, the commissioners have done great jobs in changing it. It's just the greatest game in the world. Finally, real quick, your favorite Super Bowl city? New Orleans. Uh, I think I like San Diego, although they don't go there anymore. Two great cities. And finally, make the call. Who you guys predicting wins on Sunday? Well, L.A. L.A.? I'm predicting L.A., but That's I'm hoping my quarterback from the Lions. <laughs> All right, there you go. You guys have a lot to talk about. Don, Gregory, thank you so much for your time, and thank, thank you for you being for these, us on. these Super Bowl super fans. It's so great to watch things like Good this. Good to be here. We want to thank you so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas, live from outside SoFi Stadium in California. We're going to be right back here tomorrow as we continue to count down to the Super Bowl. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.